Searing Kierkegaard, Various Readings Reminiscences of My Childhood and Youth by George Brondes Chapters 14 through 18, pages 98 to 108, 1906 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Hegel v. Kierkegaard Chapter 14 About the same time as my legal studies were thus beginning, I planned out a study of philosophy and aesthetics on a large scale as well. My day was systematically filled up from early morning till late at night, and there was time for everything, for ancient and modern languages, for law lessons from the coach, for the lectures in philosophy, which professors H. Brokner and R. Nielsen were holding for more advanced students, and for independent reading of a literary, scientific, and historic description. One of the masters who had taught me at school, a very erudite philologian, now Dr. Oscar Seesby, offered me gratuitous instruction, and with his help several of the tragedies of Sophocles and Euripides, various things of Plato's and comedies by Plautus and Terence were carefully studied. Frederick Nutzorn read the Edda and the Nibelungenlied with me in the originals. With Jens Paul de Mulier, I went through the New Testament in Greek. And with Julius Lang, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Pindar, Horace, and Ovid, and a little of Aristotle and Theocritus. Catullus, Marshall, and Caesar, I read for myself. But I did not find any positive inspiration in my studies until I approached my nineteenth year. In philosophy, I had hitherto mastered only a few books by Søren Kierkegaard, but now I began a conscientious study of Heiberg's philosophical writings and honestly endeavored to make myself familiar with his speculative logic. As Heiberg's prose writings came out in the 1861 edition, they were studied with extreme care. Heiberg's death in 1860 was a great grief to me. As a thinker, I had loved and revered him. The clearness of form and the internal obscurity of his adaptation of Hegel's teachings gave one a certain artistic satisfaction, at the same time that it provoked an effort really to understand. But in the nature of things, Heiberg's philosophical life work could not to a student be other than an admission into Hegel's train of thought and an introduction to the master's own works. I was not aware that by 1860 Europe had long passed his works by in favor of more modern thinking. With a passionate desire to reach a comprehension of the truth, I grappled with the system, began with the encyclopedia, read the three volumes of ascetics, the philosophy of law, the philosophy of history, the phenomenology of the mind, then the philosophy of law again, and finally the logic, the natural philosophy, and the philosophy of the mind in a veritable intoxication of comprehension and delight. One day, when a young girl, towards whom I felt attracted, had asked me to go and say goodbye to her before her departure, I forgot the time, her journey, and my promise to her over my Hegel. As I walked up and down my room, I chanced to pull my watch out of my pocket and realized that I had missed my appointment and that the girl must have started long ago. Hegel's philosophy of law had a charm for me as a legal student, partly on account of the superiority with which the substantial quality of Hegel's mind is there presented, and partly on account of the challenge in the attitude of the book to accepted opinions and expressions, morality here being almost the only thing Hegel objects to. But it was the book of ascetics that charmed me most of all. It was easy to understand and yet weighty, superabundantly rich. Again and again, while reading Hegel's works, I felt carried away with delight at the new world of thought opening out before me. And when anything that for a long time had been incomprehensible to me, at last, after tedious reflection became clear, I felt what I called myself an unspeakable bliss. Hegel's system of thought, anticipatory of experience, his German style, overburdened with arbitrarily constructed technical words from the year 1810, which one might think would daunt a young student of another country and another age, only meant to me difficulties which it was a pleasure to overcome. 
Sometimes it was not Hegelianism itself that seemed the main thing. The main thing was that I was learning to know a world-embracing mind. I was being initiated into an attempt to comprehend the universe, which was half wisdom and half poetry. I was obtaining an insight into a method which, if scientifically unsatisfying, and on that ground already abandoned by investigators, was fruitful and based upon a clever, ingenious, highly intellectual conception of the essence of truth. I felt myself put to school to a great intellectual leader, and in this school I learned to think. I might, it is true, have received my initiation in a school built up on more modern foundations. It is true that I should have saved much time, been spared many detours, and have reached my goal more directly, had I been introduced to an empirical philosophy, or if fate had placed me in a school in which historical sources were examined more critically, but not less intelligently, and in which respect for individuality was greater. But, such as the school was, I derived from it all the benefit it could afford to my ego, and I perceived with delight that my intellectual progress was being much accelerated. Consequently, it did not specially take from my feeling of having attained a measure of scientific insight when I learnt what I had not known at first, that my teachers, Hans Brochner, as well as Rasmus Nielsen, were agreed not to remain satisfied with the conclusions of the German philosopher, had got beyond Hegel. At the altitude to which the study of philosophy had now lifted me, I saw that the questions with which I had approached science were incorrectly formulated, and they fell away of themselves, even without being answered. Words that had filled men's minds for thousands of years, God, infinity, thought, nature, and mind, freedom and purpose, all these words acquired another and a deeper meaning, were stamped with a new character, acquired a new value, and the depurated ideas which they now expressed opposed each other and combined with each other, until the universe was pierced by a plexus of thoughts and resting calmly within it. Viewed from these heights, the petty and the everyday matters which occupied the human herd seemed so contemptible. Of what account, for instance, was a wrangling in the Senate and the Parliament of a little country like Denmark, compared with Hegel's vision of the mighty march, inevitable and determined by spiritual laws, of the idea of freedom through the world's history? And of what account was the daily gossip of the newspapers, compared with the possibility now thrown open of a life of eternal ideals, lived in and for them? 15. I had an even deeper perception of my initiation when I went back from Hegel to Spinoza and, filled with awe and enthusiasm, read the Ethica for the first time. Here I stood at the source of modern pantheistic philosophy. Here philosophy was even more distinctly religion since it took religion's place. Though the method applied was very artificial, purely mathematical, at least philosophy had here the attraction of a more original type of mind, the effect being much the same as that produced by primitive painting compared with a more developed stage. This very expression, God or nature, had a fascinating mysticism about it. The chapter in the book, which is devoted to the natural history of passions, surprised and enriched one by its simple but profound explanation of the conditions of the human soul and although his fight against superstition's views of life is conducted with a keenness that scouts discussion, whereas in modern philosophy the contention is merely implied, it seemed as though his thoughts traveled along less stormy paths. In Hegel it had been exclusively the comprehensiveness of the thoughts and the mode of the thoughts procedure that held my attention. With Spinoza it was different. It was his personality that attracted, the great man in him, one of the greatest that history has known. With him, a new type had made its entrance into the world's history. He was the calm thinker, looking down from above on this earthly life, reminding one by the purity and strength of his character, of Jesus. But a contrast to Jesus, inasmuch as he was a worshiper of nature and necessity and a pantheist. His teaching was the basis of the faith of the new age. 
He was a saint and a heathen, seditious and pious at the same time. 16. Still, while I was in this way making a purely mental endeavor to penetrate into as many intellectual domains as I could, and to become master of one subject after another, I was very far from being at peace with regard to my intellectual acquisitions, or from feeling myself in incontestable possession of them. While I was satisfying my desire for insight or knowledge, and, by glimpses, felt my supremest happiness in the delight of comprehension, an ever more violent struggle was going on in my emotions. As my being grew and developed within me, and I slowly emerged from the double state of which I had been conscious, in other words, the more I became one and individual, and strove to be honest and true, the less I felt myself to be a mere individual, the more I realized that I was bound up with humanity, one link in the chain, one organ belonging to the universe. The philosophical pantheism I was absorbed by itself worked counter to the idea of individualism inherent in me, taught me and presented to me the union of all beings in nature, the all divine. But it was not from pantheism that the crisis of my spiritual life proceeded. It was from the fountains of emotion which now shot up and filled my soul with their steady flow. A love for humanity came over me and watered and fertilized the fields of my inner world, which had been lying fallow. And this love of humanity vented itself in a vast compassion. This gradually absorbed me till I could hardly bear the thought of the suffering, the poor, the oppressed, the victims of injustice. I always saw them in my mind's eye, and it seemed to be my duty to work for them and to be disgraceful of me to enjoy the good things of life while so many were being starved and tortured. Often, as I walked along the streets at night, I brooded over these ideas, till I knew nothing of what was passing around me, but only felt how all the forces of my brain drew me towards those who suffered. There were warm-hearted and benevolent men among my near relatives. The man whom my mother's younger sister had married had his heart in the right place so much indeed that he no sooner saw or heard of distress than his hand was in his pocket, although he had little from which to give. My father's brother was a genuinely philanthropic man who founded one beneficent institution or society after the other, had an unusual power of inducing his well-to-do fellow townsmen to carry his schemes through, and in the elaboration of them showed a perception and practical sense that almost amounted to genius. This was the more surprising since his intelligence was not otherwise remarkable for its keenness, and his reasoning methods were confused. But what I felt was quite different. My feelings were not so easily roused as those of the first mentioned. I was not so good-natured or so quick to act as he. Neither did they resemble those of my other uncle, who merely represented compassion for those unfortunately situated, but was without the least vestige of rebellious feeling against the conditions or the people responsible for the misery. My uncle was always content with life as it was, saw the hand of a loving providence everywhere, and was fully and firmly convinced that he himself was led and helped by this same providence, which specially watched over the launching of his projects for the welfare of mankind. No, my feeling was quite another kind. Nothing was farther removed from me than this sometimes quiet, childish optimism. It was not enough for me to advertise the sufferings of a few individuals, and, when possible, alleviate them. I sought the causes of them in brutality and injustice, Neither could I recognize the finger of a universal ruler in a confusion of coincidences, conversations, newspaper articles, and advice by prudent men, the outcome of all which was the founding of a society for seamstresses or the erection of a hospital to counteract the misery that the controlling power had itself occasioned. I was a child no longer, and in that sense never had been childish, but my heart bled nonetheless with sympathy for society's unfortunates. I did not as yet perceive the necessity of that selfishness which is self-assertion, and I felt oppressed and tormented by all that I, in my comparatively advantageous position as a non-proletarian, enjoyed while many others did not. 
Then another mood, with other promptings, asserted itself. I felt an impulse to step forward as a preacher to the world around me, to the thoughtless and the hard-hearted. Under the influence of strong emotion, I wrote an edifying discourse, the profitable fear. I began to regard it as my duty, so soon as I was fitted for it, to go out into the town and preach at every street corner, regardless of whether a lay preacher like myself should encounter indifference or harvest scorn. This course attracted me because it presented itself to me under the guise of the most difficult thing, and, with the perversity of youth, I thought difficulty the only criterion of duty. I only needed to hit upon something which seemed to me to be the right thing, and then say to myself, you dare not do it. For all the youthful strength and daring that was in me, all my deeper feelings of honor and of pride, all my love of grappling with the apparently insurmountable to unite, and in face of this you dare not, satisfy myself that I did dare. As provisionally self-abnegation, humility, and asceticism seemed to me to be the most difficult things, for a time my whole spiritual life was concentrated into an endeavor to attain them. Just at this time, I was nineteen, my family was in a rather difficult pecuniary position, and I, quite a poor student, was cast upon my own resources. I had consequently not much of this world's goods to renounce. From a comfortable residence in Crown Princess Street, my parents had moved to a more modest flat in the exceedingly unaristocratic Salmon Street, where I had an attic of limited dimensions with outlook over roofs by day and a view of the stars by night. Quiet the nights were not, inasmuch as the neighboring houses re-echoed with screams and shrieks from poor women, whom their late returning husbands or lovers thrashed in their cups. But never had I felt myself so raised, so exhilarated, so blissfully happy as in that room. My days slipped by in ecstasy. I felt myself consecrated, a combatant in the service of the highest. I used to test my body in order to get it wholly under my control, ate as little as possible, slept as little as possible, lay many a night outside my bed on the bare floor, gradually to make myself as hardy as I required to be. I tried to crush the youthful sensuality that was awakening in me, and by degrees acquired complete mastery over myself, so that I could be what I wished to be, a strong and willing instrument in the fight for the victory of truth and I plunged afresh into the study with a passion and a delight that prevented my perceiving any lack, but month after month carried me along, increasing in knowledge and in mental power, growing from day to day. 17. This frame of mind, however, was crossed by another. The religious transformation in my mind could not remain clear and unmuddy, placed as I was in a society furled through and through by different religious currents, issued as I was from the European races that for thousands of years had been plowed by religious ideas. All the atavism, all the spectral repetition of the thoughts and ideas of the past that can lie dormant in the mind of the individual, leaped to the reinforcement of the harrowing religious impressions which came to me from without. It was not the attitude of my friends that impressed me. All my more intimate friends were Orthodox Christians, but the attempts which various ones, amongst them Julius Lang and Jens Poludon Muller, had made to convert me had glanced off from my much more advanced thought without making any impression. I was made of much harder metal than they, and their attempts to alter my way of thinking did not penetrate beyond my hide. To set my mind in vibration, there was needed a brain that I felt superior to my own, and I did not find it in them. I found it in the philosophical and religious writings of Søren Kierkegaard, in such works, for instance, as Sickness Unto Death. The struggle within me began faintly as I approached my nineteenth year. My point of departure was this. One thing seemed to me requisite, to live in and for the idea as the expression for the highest at that time was. All that rose up inimical to the idea or ideal merited to be lashed with scorn or felled with indignation. And one day as I penned this outburst, 
Heine wept over Don Quixote. Yes, he was right. I could weep tears of blood when I think of the book. But the first thing needed was to acquire a clear conception of what must be understood by the ideal. Heiberg had regarded the uneducated as those devoid of ideals, but I was quite sure myself that education afforded no criterion, and I could find no other criterion of devotion to the ideal than a willingness to make sacrifices. If, I said, I prove myself less self-sacrificing than any one of the wretches I am fighting, I shall myself incur well-merited scorn. But if self-sacrifice were the criterion, then Jesus, according to the teachings of tradition, was the ideal. For who was as self-sacrificing as he? This was an inclined plane leading to the Christian spiritual life, and a year later, when I was nearly twenty, I had proceeded so far on this plane that I felt myself in all essentials in agreement with the Christian mode of feeling, inasmuch as my life was ascetic, and my searching, striving, incessantly working mind not only found repose but rapture in prayer, and was elated and fired at the idea of being protected and helped by God. But just as I was about to complete my twentieth year, the storm broke out over again and during the whole of the ensuing six months raged with unintermittent violence. Was I at this stage of my development a Christian or not? And if not, was it my duty to become a Christian? The first thought that arose was this. It is a great effort, a constant effort, sometimes a minutely recurring effort to attain moral mastery over oneself. And though this certainly need not bring with it a feeling of self-satisfaction, much less ought to do so, it does bring with it a recognition of the value of this self-mastery. How strange, then, that Christianity, which commands its attainment, at the same time declares it to be a matter of indifference to the revealed God whether a man has lived morally or not, since faith or lack of faith is the one condition upon which so-called salvation depends. The next thought was this. It is only in the writings of Kierkegaard, in his teachings concerning paradox, that Christianity appears so definite that it cannot be confused with any other spiritual trend whatever. But when one has to make one's choice between pantheism and Christianity, then the question arises. Are Kierkegaard's teachings really historic Christianity, and not rather a rational adaptation? And this question must be answered in the negative since it is possible to assimilate it without touching upon the question of the revelation of the Holy Ghost in the shape of a dove to the voice from the clouds and the whole string of miracles and dogmas. The next thought again was this. Pantheism does not place any one unconditional goal in front of man. The unbeliever passes his life interested in the many aims that man, as man, has. The pantheist will therefore have difficulty in living a perfect ethical life. There are many cases in which, by deviating from the strictly ethical code, you do not harm anyone. You only injure your own soul. The non-believer will in this case only hardly, for the sake of impersonal truth, make up his mind to the step which the God-fearing man will take, accentuated by his passionate fear of offending God. Thus I was tossed backwards and forwards in my reflections. 18. What I dreaded most was that if I reached a recognition of the truth, a lack of courage would prevent me decisively making it my own. Courage was needed as much to undertake the burdens entailed by being a Christian as to undertake those entailed by being a pantheist. When thinking of Christianity, I drew a sharp distinction between the cowardice that shrunk from renunciation and the doubt that placed under discussion the very question as to whether renunciation were duty. And it was clear to me that, on the road which led to Christianity, doubt must be overcome before cowardice, not the contrary, as Kierkegaard maintains in his For Self-Examination, where he says that none of the martyrs doubted. But my doubt would not be overcome. Kierkegaard had declared that it was only to the consciousness of sin that Christianity was not horror or madness. For me it was sometimes both. I concluded therefrom that I had no consciousness of sin, and found this idea confirmed when I looked into my own heart. For however violently at this period I reproached myself and condemned my failings, 
They were always in my eyes weaknesses that ought to be combated, or defects that could be remedied, never sins that necessitated forgiveness, and for the obtaining of this forgiveness, a Savior. That God had died for me as my Savior, I could not understand what it meant. It was an idea that conveyed nothing to me, and I wondered whether the inhabitants of another planet would be able to understand how on the earth that which was contrary to all reason was considered the highest truth. End of recording. Reminiscences of My Childhood and Youth by George Brondes, 1906. Chapters 14 through 18, pages 98 through 108.